All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew 1, and I'm going to start where we left off last week, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. The record follows Abraham to David through the priestly line of Aaron. And starting with Abraham, it went like this. Isaac, Jacob, Levi, from whom the priest would come. Amram, who became, who was the father of Moses and Aaron. Then Aaron, the high, first high priest to be, to be spoken of, Eleazar, Phineas, Abishua, Buki, Uzi, Zerahiah, Merayoth, Amariah, then Ahitub. So if any expectant mothers are looking for baby names, there's a good list. Um, uh, Ahitub, or Ahitub, who was the, who was the priest in David's early years, when Saul was becoming jealous of David. You read about that in 1 Samuel 22, verse 12. His uh, Ahitub's name is mentioned. The rest of the verse is straightforward. 14 generations from David until the captivity going into Babylon, um, rather than 17, as there were listed, and uh, because of the three that were uh, excluded by Matthew. We covered this last week, why those three names were not counted among the lineage of the kings. Verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The phrase before they came together demands the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It demands it to be true. There was no human man involved in bringing forth divinity, the deity. Um, in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, Mary confessed, I know not a man, in the physical sense. Uh, that's very specific. The Revised Standard Version rendered that, I'm not, uh, I have no husband. Um, accepting the general understanding of marriage to be some ceremony and uh, state permission. Um, the authorized version is much more exact, um, understanding uh, the physical act, that is the knowledge Mary alluded to, is sometimes referred to as carnal knowledge. You have intimate uh, knowledge about the other person through sexual sexuality. Um, and where babies come from, Mary understood that, um, babies don't come from a state license. Babies come from two people having intimate knowledge of each other. That's why our Bible is superior to the language of every other translation. Verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter 22 for a minute. Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22, um, and just two verses, verses 20 and 21. But if this thing be true, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring um, out the damsel to the door of her father, father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones, that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shall they put uh, evil away from among you. Joseph had the legal right to have Mary uh, stoned to death for um, presumably playing a harlot or whore 
in Israel for fornication. Uh, yet here is a case of a man's righteousness going beyond the righteousness uh, required by the law, even living under the requirements of the law, the regulations of the law. Verse 19 rightly calls him a just man. You know, in the Old Testament's definition, you see words such as just, righteous, a good man, versus someone who is unjust, who is wicked, a fool, um, uh, and, a, and a sinner. It, it would talk about the righteous and sinners. And all of those things were defined by the degree of obedience someone displayed towards the laws of Moses and the commandments. If you were faithful in obeying the laws and the commandments, then the Bible would define you as a good man. As if you're known mostly for your good deeds versus your bad deeds, you are considered among the righteous, a good man, a just man. Uh, but if you, everyone knew you as someone who was committing crime, breaking the law, then you were defined as a bad man, an evil man, a wicked man, a corrupt man, uh, and so forth. In the New Testament, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so all, since all have sinned, all need to be forgiven. And uh, no one gets into heaven based on their own goodness now, based on their own effort. Even in, even in the Old Testament, when someone's righteousness or unrighteousness was measured by, by their obedience or disobedience, a righteous man or woman, based upon the goodness of their, their obedience to the commandments, could still only get as far as Abraham's bosom. It didn't get them all the way to the third heaven because there hadn't been a perfect sacrifice committed yet that would cover all of their sins. They got as far as they could get by being obedient. And uh, they, what they needed was one sac... See, God commanded man to have dominion over the animals. But to atone for his sins, he offered, he said, you sacrifice animals, and he gave the prescribed uh, ways in which it would be done by the priest. So... Uh, an animal would cover the man's guilt of sin, but every time he would sin, he would be guilty and would have to go back periodically and commit another sacrifice to cover those previous sins. What man needed was a sacrifice that was equal to him in value, uh, thus the Lord Jesus, and greater than him in value, so that it wouldn't have to be committed more than once. One time was sufficient. It was sufficient to cover all of his sins, past, present, future. But the Bible justly calls him a, or rightly calls him a just man. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Remember last week, I pointed out in Luke 2, verse 33, it, when they brought Christ to the temple, Simeon the priest said, Now, Lord, let us thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. And Luke 2, verse 33 says, Joseph and his mother marvel at those things which were spoken of him. Virtually all the new translations say, his father and mother marvel at those things, making, Christ Joseph, or making Joseph Christ's father by that slight little change. That undermines the virgin birth. That undermines the deity of Jesus Christ. Some translations say his parents. They make it even worse. It's kind of like um, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4. The Bible. She said, uh, come see a man that told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? That was a positive confession and a question, but it was a, a positive statement. She was sure of it. Is not this the Christ? Some of the modern Bibles say, could this be the Christ? They question it. And some go so far as to say, this isn't the Christ, is it? They make it a negative declaration. That's why all the Bible, other modern Bibles are perverted. Absolutely. And verse 20, again, the Holy Spirit emphasizes the fact that there was no human man involved in the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, now, the angel of the Lord is a revelation to us today. Let me spend a couple minutes on that. The classical definition uh, derived from classical Greek is that angel simply means a messenger of God. But the New Testament was written in and distributed in Koine Greek 
the language of the common man. Common people are redefining or adding new definitions to their vocabularies all the time. And this takes place in every, any language. Uh, for example, the word deck, D-E-C-K, deck, the first definition was the um, platform or the floor of a ship covering the hull, hence deck chairs, right? But then it was used to describe a, a set of playing cards, a deck of cards. It's also an abbreviation for the word decorate, like putting ornaments on a tree or somebody who's all dressed up with special jewelry and costumes, so it, she's all decked out, isn't she? <laughs> so you see how one word can grow multiple definitions. And so it is with the word angel. It doesn't simply mean a messenger of God. But the angel of the Lord um, is found in both Testaments, and it refers to Christ. Let me call your attention to some of those texts. Go back to Genesis 32. Genesis 32. Genesis 32. Start at verse 27. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So, angel is not simply a messenger of God. The word angel is an appearance of God in some form. It goes well beyond the standard understanding. Go also to the book of Judges, chapter 13. Judges 13. And begin there at verse 17. Judges 13, begin at verse 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Verse 20. For it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended up in the flame of the, of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. Now, verse 22, And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God, not just a messenger. Go forward in the New Testament to oh, Acts 27. Acts chapter 27. This is sometimes called a theophany or a Christophany, an appearance of God or appearance of Jesus Christ, a preview in the Old Testament narrative. Acts chapter 27. And notice there verse 23. Paul writes, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. The definite article, the, makes it Christ himself, not simply an angel, which would, could be interpreted as a messenger. Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, Galatians 4, and verse 14. Galatians 4, verse 14, And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, clarified, even as Christ Jesus. So in those four references, as a reference to either God himself, 
making an early appearance or Christ himself making an early appearance. But it's simply, it's not just a messenger of God, it's an appearance of God throughout the scriptures. Verse, um, so, our, so for our sake, our text today, um, and the angel of the Lord who appeared to Joseph, it means that the angel of the Lord here, verse 20, was an appearance, it's going to blow your mind, it was an appearance of Christ himself speaking to Joseph about his own conception. As wild as that is, yet comparing scripture with scripture and letting the scriptures define themselves and interpret themselves, that's the conclusion you must come to. Verse 21. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Compare that with the message Mary was given. Go over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and let's start at verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Joseph got the bare uh, facts, the bare basics of what was to take place, but Joseph was the one who named the Lord Jesus Christ. Look down at verse 25 in our text today. And knew her not, that's in the physical sense, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So the perpetual virginity of Mary, as taught by Roman Catholicism, is a myth. If you insist on the perpetual virginity of Mary, don't you also have to insist on the perpetual virginity of Joseph? Unless he was like the Kennedys, who got away with all kinds of things. Good Catholic brothers. But they never go that far with it. They don't think it through. No. So here in Matthew, uh, Joseph had the bare essentials, but as when the time came, he was the one who named Jesus, gave Jesus that name. The name Jesus is the New Testament form for the name Joshua. Uh, it has variations in the Bible, Jehoshaphat, Joash, etc. The New Testament even inserts the name Jesus for Joshua in two places. I'll call your attention to those. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 and uh, verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. That is Joshua, uh, but the word Jesus as a reference to Joshua. When he led them into the promised land, Moses had already died. He wasn't allowed to enter in. But here the New Testament uses the word Jesus, which is consistent in translating because you use the, the um, transliterated form from Joshua you know, and I mentioned a couple weeks ago, some of the names and the spellings change. You go to Hebrew, then to Greek, and the Greek into English. And sometimes Latin gets involved there to poison the spelling of some other way. <laughs> but um, so it's not uncommon to change the spelling of any name from one language to another. And also Hebrews chapter uh, 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I picked up a New Testament 
or a copy. Remember, it was a whole Bible. I forget it was a whole Bible, just the New Testament, which was put out by the Billy Graham Association years ago. It was still King James, but they did like the new King James Bible does, and they go and they take a word out and substitute a different word in. And there in Acts chapter uh, 27, they took the word Jesus out and put the word Joshua in, thinking they would help the reader understand the story. And then I sat for several years and I thought, well, whatever happened to that rendition of it? it fell by the wayside. See, God wants the right book to continue. And he doesn't want the wrong books to continue. That's why the wrong books have to keep updating themselves about every three years. But you and I are reading a, a Bible, that, a translation that's over 400 years old, that doesn't even have a copyright on its text. And God keeps it preserved by um, his own ways and means. And uh, I could describe some of that to you. You have 20 different publishing companies. Each one of them prints a different translation of the Bible. But they also print the King James Bible, whether it's Zondervan or Holman or Cambridge or Oxford or any number of other publishing companies. And each one of their King James Bibles reads essentially the same, all identical as each other. And the reason that is because of, of uh, human competition. The one company started to rechange the spelling and keep calling it the King James text. All the other companies would rise up and become self-righteous and shame on that company for changing the spelling of the blessed King James Bible. See, those companies they don't want to endure that kind of ridicule and mockery. They don't believe the word of God anyway. And the company uh, complaining, they wouldn't believe it's perfect either because they're making money selling their own product. Um, and so he uses the idea of competition and greed and envy to guarantee that the text remains the same, no matter who's publishing it. Uses man's weaknesses, man's envy, and man's natural passions to keep it set so that he doesn't in attract criticism for himself. It's marvelous the way God did it. But um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, that's Joshua, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? And um, the use of the word Jesus for Joshua is a great clue. Hebrews 4.8 points out the fact that the wilderness journey of the Jews is going to be repeated during the tribulation. Turn uh, back to the book of Micah, chapter 7. Old Testament book of Micah. Micah 7, verses 14 and 15. Micah 7, verses 14 and 15. Feed thy people with thy rod, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt will I show unto him marvelous things. And also Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, and we'll be finished in just a moment for today. Revelation 12. Verse 6, and the, woman which, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a, a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Uh, let's see. Verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So the Jew is going to be on the run, fleeing from the man of sin, seeking to persecute them, seeking to destroy them once and for all. That means everyone who's ever sought to destroy the nation of Israel, the seed of Abraham, 
has been a precursor, has been a, a, a type, a foreshadow of the ultimate Antichrist who will come. And uh, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar uh, putting an idol up to himself, or uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, the king of Egypt, wanting to destroy all the Hebrew babies and keep them from um, overpopulating, or Adolf Hitler in the 1940s. Anyone who's ever sought to destroy the nation of the Jew, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, has always met with failure. But all of them were precursors to the ultimate man of sin who will come and try to destroy the Jew. Do you know something? You can go to countries right now that are dominated largely by Islam, African nations and Middle Eastern nations, and go to countries where there are not even any Jews dwelling there, and you'll find anti-Semitism. You'll find anti-Jewish sentiment and hatred for the Jew, even among peoples where there are no Jews living there. And there are no Jews there who can influence their economies, who can influence their business, their trade, their industry, or their work, but you'll still find anti-Jewish sentiment being preached from the mosques by the imams. I got a postcard this week for a mosque up here in Rancho Cucamonga having an open mosque day for the community to come and learn about Islam. Darn it, I have to work that day. Otherwise, I'd go and say, yeah, what kind of backpacks are the best ones to wear? 